G'day Shrek here. Welcome to episode 113 with James Beckman with a special focus today on Southern Bluefin Tuna. Now if you've just tuned in and you're wondering what the hell am I listening to here, some weird spearfishing show, you're 100% correct, it's a weird spearfishing show. And uh, here's a couple of reviews to sort of let you know what you're in for. Um, Wild Wilderness from the US says, awesome resource to learn tips and tricks with getting started and great advice from experienced people. Uh, Thunder Cam from Aussie says, hey Shrek, this was a great episode. Uh, he's talking about Duncan Hemp, uh, du the Duncan Henderson episode. I'm working at Adreno Brisbane and we just revived the new Sparrow Evo, which has a lot of the features you guys are talking about. A lot of spear, a lot of rubbers and high accuracy. Even Rob Allen himself is now using these guns. Uh, he goes on to say, just a um, really good technical episode. Thanks, Duncan, um, for that one, by the way. Um, he's a mechanical engineering student. We geeked out on guns hard in that episode. So if you are into learning more about spear guns, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to that. It's a bit more of a, the sort of the technical info. And Duncan is definitely a good man to chat with about that. Um, what else did I have for you? Oh, this one here. Just wanted to say your podcast is great. I listen to episode 62 first because I know Jim, he's from Monterey and I'm, I live in Santa Cruz, California. Awesome tips and tricks, great stories from Spiros all over and you guys are hilarious. Turbo is definitely the hilarious one and uh, we miss him here on the podcast but the show rolls on anyway. I try to be funny but mostly it's just B grade dad jokes so sorry about that in advance. But um, if you're here for Stoke to up your skills and knowledge, then uh, the New Spirit Podcast is definitely a good place to do that. Today, you're in for an absolute treat. I've got um, James Beckman here from at Southern Spearfishing on Instagram. He's a really good, interesting man to follow as well. He takes really good photography. He's just a top bloke as well. Like I got out for a full day diving with him. We we dove a lot of the inside of Port Phillip Bay because uh, conditions outside were atrocious. But um, I... I uh, <clears throat> I took down what I'm terming the uh, Melbourne Trophy 3, uh, a dusky Morwong, a blue throat wrasse, and a scallop. Um, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I arrived in Melbourne on a shoulder season. I was a week before the cray season opened. I was a week after the squid run. Um, Southern bluefin tuna went running, plus the conditions outside were awful. Uh, the water was a little too cool for kingies, and so... but. The consolation prize every time you go diving in Melbourne is you get a big feed of scallops, um, which are a lot of work, but man, they taste good. And there's mussels, oysters, and um, there's a lot of other little uh, reef fish around. If you go looking and you want to work hard, um, you, you can get a really good feed in Melbourne. And the, and the diving's actually good. Uh, if you can get past the cold water, and like with today's wetsuits, like with a, with a five mil suit, Melbourne is... Um, well and truly tolerable, and uh, I, I would even say enjoyable. Plus, they sport with three spearfishing clubs that I mentioned last week. They've got Geelong Freedivers, Club Spearfish, and the Southern Freedivers. All fantastic options if you're in the area. Uh, but anyway, today's episode is more of a highlight in on Southern Bluefin Tuna, and this is sort of a, a really interesting episode. If you've just ta targeted reef fish previously, then and you're thinking about targeting something big and pelagic, pelagic sorry, Matt, um, then today's episode is definitely uh, a good one for you. Um, let's dig right in and hook in with James. Top bloke, interesting fella, lots of knowledge and tips in this one. Let's hook in. I hate it when a set of booties just blow out. You know, you're walking along a rocky ledge and they just give up on you one day, tear, or even worse, you, f you fall over and your foot gets ripped through what was a small hole and is now an irreparable mess. It's time to head down to your local spearfishing retail shop. And here in Australia, that probably means Adreno. Now, spearfishing.com.au are a long, long time sponsor and supporter of the Noob Spirit podcast. So we would encourage you to head down to any of their stores. They are located in Melbourne, Brisbane, Sydney, and now Perth. And they've got a huge range of spearfishing gear. Head in and talk to a great bunch of people who know exactly what they're talking about and should be able to point you in the right direction. If it's something simple like a pair of booties, boom, two mil Cressies, I love them. But I'm going to try it a whole lot more soon and uh, send up a post on nospiro.com. But check it out, spearfishing.com.au. Head into a local Adreno store. So we're live in store here at uh, here at Adreno in Melbourne, and I've got I've got a I've got a special guest today. So welcome to the New Spiro Podcast, James. Um, just give us a little bit of background about yourself and how you got started spearfishing. How long have you been spearfishing for? 
Uh, thanks for having me, Shrek, and uh, it's good to be on the Noob Spiro. It's uh, something I've been listening to for a number of years, and you guys have yeah, been doing it for quite a while now. Congratulations. So, uh, my name's James, and I've been uh, spearfishing down in Melbourne for probably the consistently the last six, six, seven years, and it's been uh, quite a learning curve in that time. But I actually got started uh, quite a bit before that. When I was a little kid, uh, I just had an obsession with fish in general, and uh, just, I, I don't know, just a big fish nerd in primary school and high school. And that, uh, that led me to an opportunity in high school where my high school uh, provided an opportunity to go snorkeling during activities during the week. And I was lucky enough to have one of my teachers here, who is a local legend by the name of Pang Kwong. He's uh, one of the guys who's a massive waterman here in Victoria. Most of you guys probably have never heard of him, but he has done things like uh, guided the BBC on their documentaries. Mm. And he also has a license to catch uh, sea dragons in Victoria and breeds them. And he's one of the, I think he pioneered breeding sea dragons in captivity and he supplies them to aquariums around the world and consults on that. So he was pretty contagious? Quite. Yeah, so he was a, a massive influence and just, you know, my school having that opportunity through my school to go out snorkeling with him and his influence on that, it was just like a great opportunity for me to get into it there. He, he was the guy who put a first uh, hand spear in my hand and uh, we were down at Mornington and uh, I was chasing really, really small fish in the shallows. Let's uh, not say how small they were. And, uh, you have to start somewhere. Yeah, you do have to start somewhere. And the first, uh, I guess that first sort of introduction of seeing southern calamari or squid swimming around and trying to chase them and I was just absolutely way too slow for them <laughs> as you do uh, you, big learning curve but yeah that went through high school and it kind of fell off a bit but came back through uh, just yeah in the last several years been getting into it and a mate uh, introduced me reintroduced me uh, in Victoria uh, he had he'd, he'd been out in Western Australia and he came back and he, uh, yeah, he had a massive 1.4 metre gun and a, a free diving wetsuit, which I'd never even seen or heard of. And we went down in the middle of Hang summer. Yeah, you, you started spearing in Melbourne without, without a suit. <laughs> we did, we did. <laughs> so yeah, I, um, I, he, he sort of like, he was a bit more experienced and uh, took me out middle of summer. I actually had a surfing wetsuit mm. and uh, we went down into the water and he's like, yeah, we'll go out and we'll like shoot some fish for dinner, which sounded amazing, like being able to put fish on the table. Yeah. Uh, so get in the water and we've got a, a big 1.4 meter gun that he hands to me. I couldn't even load, I didn't even know how to load this thing. Like it was a pretty big gun, but just yeah, I just couldn't get my head around loading it. I uh, had a surfing wetsuit and I was cold within about 10 minutes. Mm. And it was also the first time I realised that I get seasick really easily. Mm. So I lasted about 25 minutes in the water, didn't see a single fish and thought it was great fun. So, you know, <laughs> came back and uh, went for it again on that, other occasions. That, that's spearfishing for a lot of us. It is, what, isn't it? What made you stick with it? Oh, just that passion, like the underlying passion for fish and being in the water. Like previous to that, I've done lots of things like uh, surf life-saving and surfing and just been in and around water all my life, really. So having that level of comfort in the water outside of being seasick, obviously, but that level of comfort was just sort of a bit natural to me. And, you know, in Australia, we really take it for granted that we learn to swim at a young age mm. and we have that familiarity with being in the water and it's really played into something that you know like I'm comfortable with as it is and yeah just just being there in that in that sense. So I'll make come back from WA with his uh, 1.4 meter gun um, I don't know what the hell he do with it in Melbourne uh, apart from maybe chase some of the pelagics that you do get at 
at times. Um, what what were some of the the skills he began teaching you? What were some of the first things you learned? Because there's a, there's a hell of a lot of obstacles. There's a hell of a lot of challenges to overcome. I was yesterday I was explaining to someone there's the free diving aspect, there's the hunting aspect, there's all the safety issues, there's being a good buddy, there's etiquette, there's caring for your catch, there's the whole lot, we've got to learn all of it. What what were some of the struggles he helped you overcome? Well, the first struggle was actually learning how to load a gun. That was uh, that was pretty hard, but we uh, we managed to get it done. So what did he teach you? Uh, just the technique, especially with the long guns, you're, you're sort of like it's a two-stage process. You need to first pull the bands back within arm's reach yeah. and put the butt either on your hip, butt of the gun either on your hip or onto your chest and then you can load onto either a loading tab and then fully load to the end of the gun or uh, you can go straight there if you're, if you're strong enough for that. So what sort of gun did you have at that time? It was, uh, that gun was an Aimrite, 1.4 metre Aimrite Super Venom okay. and uh, yeah it might have been a bit of overkill for Victorian waters but coming from, Calamari. yeah, <laughs> blasting <laughs> rocks. But coming from WA, that sort of the thing, yeah, it, yeah. you can uh, use that over there. So but, what did you buy? Uh, so my first gun was subsequently an Aimrite, actually, and it was one of Travis's first Aimrite roller guns. Uh, it was quite a few years ago uh, when he sort of was first developing those. And I got a 95 centimetre roller, and it was primo for Victoria. Those smaller gun ranges, like that metre size gun range, give or take, is pretty perfect for... Victoria, it's short enough to poke around the reef and uh, you get most of your fish with that. Uh, you can track fish easily with it and uh, yeah, you can really manoeuvre it around. It's something that the uh, bigger guns are a bit less, a uh, bit more cumbersome, so you yeah. can, yeah, it's uh, harder to target those reef fish. But it's a bit small for the big fish that we get here, like the kingfish and the southern bluefin tuna, so of course an upgrade later on was necessary but yeah but back to the question about what he what he taught me uh he taught me quite a lot about diving and hunting and it was really good and uh he also like being in that sport we met quite a few people down diving down where we'd go and meeting those people you meet other people that they dive with and then you know one of them's involved in a club so you get involved in the club and then you know you can really meet quite a lot of the of the fellow divers in your state and around and you know getting involved in the club scene was sort of a really big one for me in terms of uh, getting free boat rides which is always handy yeah. and uh, yeah just learning learning how to hunt fish in general. So you're a little bit sport down here you've actually got a active spearfishing club as opposed to where I started learning, mostly in Queensland and, and particularly in the southeast corner, um, is the did you get involved with club spearfish early in your days, or what was the story there? So I'm actually not involved with club spearfish of all oh, things. What a bastard! <laughs> so we've got three clubs here in. Well, I think there's there might be more than three clubs, but there's three main clubs. Uh, Southern Freedivers, they are one of the long-standing clubs. Uh, organised and founded back in the 90s. Uh, they've been going for a long time and they're mostly competition focused. They do quite a lot of the serious comps and uh, those guys are really competitive and some of the best Spiros that you've never heard of are part of this club okay. and they, um, yeah, they're, they're really competitive and really good divers. Uh, there's Club Spearfish, which do a couple of competitions and they are more so, social diving based so they do a lot of social events and have gatherings and meetings and uh, a lot of the beginners go there and you know they get shown around and mm. they, uh, they can find that pretty good. Mm. Uh, the Geelong Freedivers on the other side of the bay, uh, they're sort of a mix between the two like they hold a few competitions and a few social events and uh, it kind of caters for the guys on the on the west coast of Victoria. And there's been other clubs like uh, the Surf Coast Spearfishing Club, but they uh, they disbanded and uh, yeah, there's been other clubs okay. as well. So good to have some distinctions there, like clubs definitely do seem to be of one flavour or another. Comps uh, rule some clubs um, and you know a lot of the divers start to reflect that. Um, obviously the social side of things is great, but when you're starting and you're 
barely competent, and I was barely competent for a few years. Some of us um, still are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I'm still barely competent in some areas. Um, but, like, I had a lot of trouble getting out and getting on boats. What did you do to try and convince people that you were worth taking out? So the best thing you can do is uh, probably join a club, for starters, and you get to uh, know the guys because... I don't know, some, some guys are a bit funny with taking people they don't know out on their boats, like spearfishers, spearfishermen particularly mm -hmm. are pretty funny guys, mm -hmm. like they're a bit weird. And so they've got these processes and systems and, you know, if you don't put your gear in the right place on a the boat, they might get a bit mm. weird about it or like if you've got a banana on the boat or something, like it's, mm. they're pretty weird guys. So, you know, you've got to make yourself familiar with them or like introduce yourself and you know, perhaps offer to pay for the fuel because owning a boat's bloody expensive. Yeah. Uh, and the least, the least you can do is, you know, offer more than the fuel cost and, you know, offer to help out cleaning. Sorry, like last night I was chatting with a mate till well into the early hours of the morning and he took his new boat out and a guy gave him 20 bucks. And I, <laughs> he was furious. He was like, <laughs> because I, and I think once you own a boat, you understand like twenty bucks does not even it's, it's, it doesn't do anything. No. Like, um, what's your rule of thumb when you go out with someone else? What do you sort of what's your what have you learned actually with regards to etiquette and all the rest of the stuff you're talking? Ah, uh, firstly, it's fifty bucks minimum, even no matter how big the day is. Yeah. It's uh, like if it's a big big day, you, you're doing more than that, and you're splitting costs. And I'll get into some of the cost splitting that we do for big trips yeah. out west later, but like a day on the water is 50 bucks. It's just, that's, that's, just, that's just minimum. Mm. Because the guy's spent tens of thousands on his boat. Mm. He services his engine once a year, which is, you know, anywhere up to $1,000 depending on that, or if he's got two engines maybe. <laughs> um, and, you know, basic fuel for the day is super expensive anyway, so. So when you go on someone else's boat, What's your rules that you that you personally stick to or try to stick to when you go out? Um, I've I've tried to uh, let the boaty get the first fish. That's obviously <laughs> that's obviously a big one. But some boaties are pretty good and they will uh, try and put you onto the fish. So yeah, but you know you got to uh, got to give the guy the opportunity yeah, yeah. to do that. Um, but also just like offering to clean, offering to drive if they're sort of you know wanting to get into the water early. Being boaty for starters, like you got to give the guy a bit of a break. He's he might have like driven his car out to the ramp, which might be two hours away. Then he's driving the boat all day, and uh, if we're driving around, say we're out offshore chasing tuna, mm. uh, he's trying to put you onto a fish. You might might be pretty good to uh, offer him the opportunity to mm. get onto the fish and take that responsibility as a boatie nice. and if you're unsure like just ask him how the boat works and you know if there's anything that you need to know like quite a few of the guys uh, run uh, fly-by-wire throttles which are super touchy so mm. you know taking off can be yeah can be pretty interesting yeah. on the on those electronic throttles but yeah it's uh, good to offer the offer your service as the captain in that respect so yeah and you love just going straight from forward, just flat out into reverse. Yeah, well, I, I, I own a jet ski, so I only know one, one throttle <laughs> position. One way. One, yeah. Wide open and that's it. I think, I think one thing it brings to my attention is that we should do a full episode just on boating etiquette and yeah. how to get by. Like I've seen a boat where I went out with five guys, everyone bought three spear guns, you know, and then spear shafts as well. Yeah, there's just shit everywhere. And then... Um, like another good rule that um, a bloke gave me was just one crate or one bag for all your stuff. And as soon as you go over that and you're out in a group, it's a pain in the ass. But um, moving on, like what's a real memorable sort of um, maybe an early catch for you that sort of um, started started to help take shape for the rest of your spearfishing? So I've got quite a few memorable first catches and especially in Victoria, there's a lot of the species that you start to tick off and you... Uh, you know, you go through and you like get your first crayfish or your first snapper or your first kingfish. But specifically, my most memorable fish is uh, in Western Australia. I caught a 22 kilo dewfish. Uh, guys that don't know here, the dewfish 
in Western Australia, spelt D H U. Uh, it's their one of their highly prized reef fish over there. Mm. They grow up to 25 kilos, I think, is about the maximum. Uh, on this trip, I was invited over by one of our mates who used to work at Adreno, Ant, and uh, he he invited me and another another local guy over. Uh, we were taken out by him, and it was our first dive trip in Western Australia and it was our first day in the water and he was being a champion and driving us around and he put me onto this fish and I shot a 22 kilo dewfish uh, and it's easily my most memorable fish. So how did that dive take place? Did you see it from the surface? I saw it from the surface. Um, I went to dive on it and I realised I didn't have my camera rolling, so I pulled back on it and the fish darted into the cave and I hit record and then dived back down on it and just came up from behind and plugged it from behind. Uh, just to put into perspective again, like guys, Western Australia guys will, could go their entire dive careers not shooting a 20 kilo dewfish and it's kind of one of those trophy species that they have over there. So for me to go over there, on the first day, on my first dive and, you know, plug one of these fish was just amazing. And it kind of put into perspective, like, you, you shoot fish and you, uh, you shoot these amazing fish in Victoria, but when you, when you manage to get onto a fish like that, that you realise you're never going to get another one of those again. It's sort of, like, pretty special and pretty memorable. So you can't really... Yeah. Awesome, man. Uh, we're going to hook into a little bit about Melbourne species and conditions and stuff when we uh, have a panel interview after this one. But um, I wonder, like, have you ever had a, a moment out in the ocean that just absolutely scared the shit out of you? I have. I've had actually quite a few of them. So I'll quickly go through a couple, but I'll sit on one of them. But, yeah, so I was diving for crayfish once uh, off the back beaches. Uh, I wasn't alone, but that doesn't really matter in this situation early on in my diving and I was uh, hunting in some pretty serious surge in the shallows so it was quite there was quite a lot of uh, wave energy sweeping me backwards and forwards uh, one of the techniques I used to do and I still do it quite a bit is I'll mark a cray ledge with a gun and on this occasion my gun was still loaded, so I put the gun down in the ledge where the cray was and just so I knew where to go back to. When I breathed on the surface, dove back down on it. And as I went in for the cray, the gun, the loaded gun uh, swept across my throat and it, uh, it cut the throat of my wetsuit. It didn't pierce my skin at all, but I had a loaded gun that uh, touched, like it cut the neoprene of that and uh, just swept through and that was a massive wake-up call to uh, unload your gun when you go chasing crayfish. Um, I was using, an, that was the Aimrite right roller so it was, uh, yeah, it was quite, a, quite an interesting situation. Another crayfish situation, again using my gun at the same spot about three months later, I had it unloaded uh, but I had thrown the gun into the cave to mark it again and this crayfish was in about 14 metres of water. It had, uh, it was quite an effort for me back at the start of my diving to get down there and pull it out and it was quite a big one as well so I dive into the cave and it scuttled all the way back but I could just get my hands on it. I uh, managed to pull it out and as I went to the surface the shooting line of the gun had wrapped around my dive belt and was holding me down as I was trying to go up. I had an armful of crayfish and was just, yeah, essentially in a bit of a state, like at the end of my breath, trying to get to the surface. And I just remained calm in that situation and uh, unhooked the shooting line uh, and yeah, still managed to get to the surface, but kind of taught me to uh, perhaps keep the gun a bit further away from crays when you're chasing them. Key takeaways from both of those? Unload your gun when you're chasing crayfish and perhaps uh, move them away from the from where your cray is. Because you, you don't specifically need to put your gun 
right on top of the crayfish. It can be a bit further away or you can use a personal anchor to drop a weight nearby. Normally when I do that, I just drop it out on the sand about five metres away and it's fine now. But I have one more, okay. uh, one more scary story. Okay. Um, so again in WA, and this one was actually just recently in Western Australia. Uh, I borrowed a mate's boat and we were off the mid coast of Dongara and I was with a mate, one of my local dive mates, Stodge. Uh, we had driven from Perth maybe three hours or something it takes to get up to Dongara and we had looked at the maps and there was some amazing offshore reef line. Pretty much Western Australia has these great outer reef barriers that hug the coastline and these ones were about 12 or 13 k's offshore. Uh, we got there at midday, we drove out there and it was super green on the way out and we were worried that we wouldn't get any clear visibility. So we kept driving and we eventually got onto the outer breaks and went down south off them and found some beautiful clean water. It was about, I don't know, 25 metres viz. It was really good. Uh, but the swell was up. It was about three metre swell. And the winds were a westerly, about 12 knot westerly winds. Uh, we first anchored our boat in, off the outside reefs in the middle of them. And we, uh, we watched the boat and we were pretty sketch on it. And we, and I said, no, nah, we've got to, we've got to move the boat cause it's going to break anchor. <clears throat> and so we moved the boat further south, but still on the outside of the breakers. Uh, and we jumped in the water. We were happy with that. Let out a whole, whole bunch more anchor rope. We were happy with that. Jumped in the water, swam a kilometer away and turned around and watched the boat break anchor and get hauled through the breakers and over the reef. Yeah, it was pretty, pretty dicey. Uh, we started swimming after it and for ages we lost the boat and we swam around the breakers and to this day we don't know how the boat stayed upright and wasn't rolled, but it didn't. It had survived for some reason uh, and it was getting pushed inshore. Uh, but we swam after it, we swam about two or three kilometres to get it, picked it up, jumped in the boat, and uh, yeah, we, we managed to save the boat. Uh, and yeah, it was a good end story. We also found the anchor, which it broke <laughs> off, which is pretty amazing. But yeah, it was uh, pretty scary. So the, the bilge pump got a workout? The bilge pump got a workout, and uh, yeah, unfortunately, my mate's wife, who, uh, whose boat it was, uh, didn't get the boat sunk. So she, uh, she, uh, she's been aiming to have that boat taken away somehow, and we right. tried our hardest, but she uh, broke, her heart. broke her heart that we returned boat. it to her. So yeah. Um, takeaways from that, like um, did, when you, because often in Queensland, where I, where I dive a lot, we, 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 we always um, run a boatie, so the boat's never at anchor because of the current and stuff like that. Plus you want fast response if there's other boats in the area or, you know, like um, you got fish in the water and sharks and all the rest of it. Um, down here, you, do, you, do you anchor a little bit? Yep. Yeah, we do. So what's your process for that? Do you go down and um, view where the anchors hold up, make sure it's got a good grip? So Western Australia diving and Victorian diving are a bit different. Oh, for sorry, yeah. Western Australia, we, uh, on this occasion, bit more of a shark presence so we both wanted to be in the water at the same time yeah. just to sort of manage each other diving uh in hindsight one of us should have been boating that's just the way it was but uh in victoria we <coughs> definitely do a lot more anchored boating like anchored diving like we'll take boats drive them offshore off to the islands or around the coastline anchor them up and uh yeah just check it out but you're right we do check the anchor uh, we we make sure that there's enough rope out. We make sure that we're kind of diving nearby. And a lot of the times in Victoria, we are diving quite close to the boats. Whereas in Western Australia, you might want to be working a deep reef line that goes off on a tangent and you just follow that out to wherever and it can lead you quite a fair way away from the boat in that sense. But a lot of the boat based stuff we do here in Victoria, it's quite close to the boat. So how much anchor and how much 
so sorry, how much chain and how much rope do you want out of the boat, and what style of anchors, in your opinion, are, are the most effective? The one that holds, is that the most effective? The sand anchors are good because they can dig right into the reef cracks and into sand, obviously, but uh, a lot of the guys up north use these four prong anchors that are reef anchors, which they can effectively pull off a reef and it bends the tines of them. Uh, we don't really use them down here much. We're using more of the um, spade anchors to dig into reef and stuff. Uh, but especially in Victoria, we're not necessarily diving as deep as say Queensland or Western Australia uh, for deep reef species. A lot of our species are in quite shallow water so we don't have to yeah we don't have to really set anchors in you know 30 meters where it might be inaccessible or you might find a bommie that comes up to sort of 25 meters it's mm. less of that we'd normally anchor in you know 10 meters or 15 meters sometimes 20 plus but that's quite rare so you have what 10 meters of chain yeah about and about what is it like one and a half times your boat length and then you're meant to let out anchor rope about four times your boat length or five times your boat length to depth ratio. I'm not too sure of that, but um, I'll just let out enough until it holds or, <laughs> or it doesn't. And then we figure that out when we, when we swim after the boat. And yeah, it's happened a couple of times we swam after boats when they don't hold. Today I've got a sweet offer for you. To go with this free episode of the Noob Spirit podcast, I've got access to some free courses. How cool is that? Go to noobspirit.com forward slash Ted. Now Ted Hardy from Immersion Freediving, a frequent guest on the Noob Spirit podcast, has got several free courses available at noobspirit.com forward slash Ted. Check it out, Freediving Safety. There's a full video course about how to avoid shallow water blackout, how to be a good buddy, all is the fundamentals of just being a good safe Spiro and it's all free. Check it out, nospiro.com forward slash Ted. There's another one in there as well about how to take a 20 to 30% bigger breath, which will give you more fuel, more time on the bottom and uh, make you a more effective Spiro. There's also a whole lot of other courses there as well. Check them out, get a 15% discount, nospiro.com forward slash Ted. Today's episode is brought to you by Patreon. It's a membership platform that makes it easy for artists and creators like the Noob Spiro to get paid. Basically, you support us per episode at any level that you choose. Head over to patreon.com forward slash Noob Spiro. Today's episode powered by patron listeners just like you. Today's Noob Spiro podcast is also proudly brought to you in partnership with penetratorfins.com. Get on there, guys. Have a look at some of the designs they've got. They've got clears. The blacks are beautiful. Check out the Noob Spiro custom Oki print. It's mad as well. Larry's got a full range of wicker designs, and he's got a beautiful finish on his fins. He's uh, recently updated his manufacturing process. It's even better than it was before. He makes some of the best fins in the world. And uh, to, to make that offer even sweeter, pump in the code Noob Spiro at checkout and save another 20 bucks. Penetratorfins.com. Support the Noob Spiro podcast by shopping with our sponsor. Let's move into Veterans Vault. So we'll talk about Southern Bluefin China, which, as I understand it, is a is a fishery that's doing pretty well. It's actually a fisheries management um, victory story at the moment, uh, going through the news because their stocks ten years ago were near desolated, and they've managed the fishery pretty well, and it's coming back. They're saying it's not as good as it could be, or maybe should be, but um, it's something that you guys seem to be taking advantage of a lot. And um, I know a lot of people are curious about it. They um, look like a hell of a lot of fun to shoot. So where do we start? Yes, it's an amazing fishery that we have here. And it's probably one of the things that saves Victoria in terms of uh, spearfishing. <laughs> you have quite a lot of tasty reef fish, but they're pretty small. And we occasionally get a kingfish through the summer. Uh, but southern bluefin tuna are actually here all year round. And it's uh, a year round fishery that guys can target, I believe, tuna have been shot and line caught in every month of the year which is pretty amazing uh can we, can we just get a show of hands from you guys ha, ha, have anyone taken southern bluefin tuna have any of you guys taken them well, there's, there's a handful out there there's cool. four hands for cool. those guys Who's, are you guys curious about this fishery yes. yeah all right cool. <laughs> so yeah it's kind of 
Look, I don't claim to pioneer it. There's been guys that have been diving southern bluefin for well over a decade and they've successfully hunted them. But it is quite a new fishery in that respect that we're still learning techniques and where they are and how to find them. And specifically myself, it's been a massive learning curve how to, how to target them and how to target them effectively. And I would say that of all the things going on in Victoria, Southern bluefin are the least efficient fish that I go out and hunt. And okay. it's quite a high ratio of trips to fish in that respect. <laughs> but it kind of shows that it's, uh, yeah, they're there and it's just, we see them a lot more than we take them and uh, it's quite frustrating, but really, really good in that respect. So, so my um, <coughs> turbo will laugh, but my 1970s circa uh, guide to Australian marine fishes um, l listed them as predating mainly upon pilchards. Um, where, where, how far out are you going? What depth are you finding them in and what are they predating upon? So a quick overview of the fish stock. They uh, And just to touch back on your recovery story, uh, it's been a massive recovery in terms of numbers. I believe it's gone from somewhere around 4 or 5% of pre-industrial stocks uh, when it was overfished with the, with the massive pressure in the 90s, 80s and 90s. And just recently they've quoted numbers of up over 10%. So it's pretty impressive that they've been able to turn around in this sort of modern age where there's an always increasing pressure on fish. Uh, it's not the case for the northern bluefin species. Uh, they're in dire straits, but it's definitely something that we can take as a, as a really positive step for our fishery down here in Melbourne. Um, but the fish are generally on the south coast. I think they their range starts from uh, Western Australia and they breed in the Indian Ocean and they spawn out there and swim down the south, the west coast of the Western Australia and along the south coast of Australia. So is that the Llewellyn Current? The yeah, bottom? the Llewellyn Current brings them down and they get really small fish out there. I, I know the guys that spear them have probably see 10 kilo fishes, sort of their bigger fish there, which is pretty small. Yeah. Uh, when I was over there, I saw a school of about two or three kilo fish, which is pretty amazing, but uh, yeah, again, pretty small. And then they, that stretches all the way through to New South Wales. I believe they kind of got to the mid-north coast and they're, uh, yeah, they're quite, uh, quite a big range ac across the southern half of Australia. Uh, in Victoria, we get them anywhere from, well, we've had them in Port Phillip Bay in a handful of metres. There's been videos of guys uh, filming tuna on the piers which is pretty amazing and it's quite an unusual situation but we've still targeted fish in quite shallow water and one of the more successful hunts that I had was in 20 metres of water mm. give or take and there was plenty of schools of fish out there and uh, that ranges all the way through to off the continental shelf in you know a couple of kilometres of water and you might be finding them quite close in on shore, maybe a couple of hundred metres offshore, all the way through to a uh, hundred kilometres plus. And some areas where you go out off the shelf is quite yep. a decent hike and day in the water. Probably not 20 bucks worth of fuel <laughs> for that day. <laughs> but yes, it's uh, quite, a, quite a size range here too. We've watched fish as little as a couple of kilos get pulled in through to, I believe, just recently, a fish of 160 something kilos was caught online off the coast. Wow. Uh, we also just had a, an amazing run of the big 100 kilo fish come through Victoria, which we took great advantage of and uh, managed to get onto a few. You're, you're heading out off the shelf to, to target these most of the time. Are you looking for a, a bait ball? Are you looking for birds working? Or are you, then are you using burly? I've never ever hunted tuna. Um, I've heard this is, I've heard that you you know you might get a burly trail going, and then you're better off just aiming at your own burly because the fish move that quickly that you can't track them and shoot them anyway. So, it's it's right. There are quite a few techniques that we do use, um, and there's kind of we're kind of discovering that there's a few different types of fish that you'll come across on a day. 
uh, you'll very rarely come across easy fish and generally it's a bright sunny day with no wind and you'll see a few ripples on the water and underneath those ripples are a few hundred to a thousand plus southern bluefin tuna doing a very slow vortex and you can drive your boat right up to them jump in the water they don't care that you're there and you can pretty much swim up to any fish and shoot them uh, it's quite rare that these things happen but it does happen uh, through to pretty hard fish like there's fish that are working bait balls generally and the bait ranges from pilchards or sardines through to small glassies which are about a centimetre long and quite clear uh, through to souries which are kind of like an ocean garfish okay. which can be quite big uh, there's a whole different range of bait fish in there of different sizes and one of the things that you don't know going into a day of spearfishing is what they're feeding on so no. you don't know if the pilchards you're taking are going to work or if you get need to use other methods uh, so yeah it's quite a learning curve to go out there and just jump in the water and figure out what's happening on the day is that when something like that might be handy but yes <laughs> you know like dates times temperatures so what uh, shrek's pointing to there is the uh <laughs> new spiro spearing there. log um it's the like. log book that uh, everyone should be writing down their dives in and just figuring out what's happening on the day and so you can flick back to it and remember what you did and what time of the year it was what the weather was doing we kind of think that the moon plays a big part in mm what the feeding habits of the tuna are doing, uh, yeah, what the wind and tide are doing as well. So so the Spiro log was like early in the podcast, we chatted with a guy and he told us that he kept a log. And I thought, that's bloody clever because generally fish replicate the same behaviour in certain seasons. There's spawns at the same time of year, all that sort of stuff. So keeping a log just makes sense. But uh, I think it's a good practice to get into. So have you started doing that with Southern Bluefin? I have actually, and specifically about when we're finding fish and uh, where they are. Yeah. We have a massive coastline here in Victoria and they can literally be anywhere across the coastline. Yeah. So knowing where to go out and which ramp to head to it plays a big part in your success for the day. Uh, we just recently went out for two days off the west coast and didn't see a single fish. So it's, yeah, it's important to know kind of where the fish are and uh, yeah. That, did that, you burn through twenty dollars in fuel? We burnt it through about twenty bucks, yeah, yeah, nice. give or take. Cool. Uh, so just heading back to a bit more about the bluefin. Uh, so in these marginal days that you'll go out chasing them, you you'll generally be chasing them off bait balls, and depending on what type of bait they are chasing, uh, is depending on how you're going to approach the fish. If they're chasing big bait like pilchards or souries, then you want to be stocked up with pilchards and you want to have, you know, like 15 kilos of pilchards on your boat on a good day. And there's been days where we've burnt through that many pilchards in the first couple of hours and then we've got fish, but it's kind of the end of the day. Uh, the other days are chasing much smaller bait they won't even look at your pilchards. They, they'll just, they won't even take a second glance at them and swim right by. Uh, things like the glasses and the red bait, uh, they just, they're on a different feeding schedule. On those days, you're just hoping to swim into the middle of a big workup and uh, plug a, a fast moving fish. There's not really any other way about those days. And finally, the last situation you'll be out a day on a water is there's no fish and there's plenty of those as we've uh, discovered. I think we get to the crux of the matter. Probably equipment is where guys are going to start coming unstuck because um, the, there's the mass of the fish, the, just the sheer mass your shaft's got to penetrate is, is huge. So um, is that something that's taken a while for you to figure out? Uh, definitely. Uh, we, our other big pelagic fish here is kingfish and a lot of the guys will start 
hunting kingfish and they'll use a bigger gun. Like I stepped up to a 1.2 metre gun to shoot kings and it was uh, quite effective. And that gun can be used for southern bluefin, but small southern bluefin, if you're, if you're trying to shoot a fish that's sort of bigger than 20 kilos with your kingfish gun, it might not have the range and as Shrek said, that power to penetrate through the fish. What a lot of guys don't appreciate is how wide these fish are. I mean, they're called barrels. The big fish are called barrels for a reason. Like they're, they're thick fish. And if you, you are trying to hunt one of those bigger 100 kilo fish, you've got you know, anywhere up to sort of like half a metre or more of fish to punch through, which is quite a decent, decent amount of power that you need. And it's not like a kingfish, which is relatively narrow. Uh, the spear can generally hold good range and power across sort of like a, a three, four metre shot for a kingfish, but you just need to really step up quite a bit with your gun and power to hunt these bigger fish. But yeah, generally you will get away with shooting tuna uh, with your kingfish gun up to about 20 kilos. Uh, but over 20 kilos, you kind of want to start stepping up your gear. And one of the things with diving for southern bluefin in Victoria is you don't actually know what size fish you're going to come across. Yeah. With kings, you kind of, we, we have them up to about 20 kilos and that's about where we go for them, which is a Pretty good fish. But really. yeah, it's kind of, that's the, that's kind of the size on those. When you go out hunting bluefin, you could be shooting 10 kilo fish or you could be shooting 100 kilo fish. And there's been times when guys have gone out chasing schoolfish, those 20 kilo fish, which is probably about the average size we get here in Victoria. And they've seen much bigger fish, uh, sort of like in that 80 kilo range. They've shot them and they've managed to uh, put a shaft into a, a fish and it's just swum off with all their gear. So being prepared in that situation, it's much better to be overpowered in that sense than underpowered. And it's not like uh, you're shooting around a reef. You don't have the risk of shooting your spear into a rock behind the fish. So there's not really any downside of taking a really big gun out, even if you only think you're going to shoot 20 kilo fish. One, you can have more range. And there are so many times that I've been out on the water and have had 20 kilo fish that are sitting for a perfect shot at five meters range. And if I have something like, you know, a big blue three, three band gun, blue water three band gun, I could have hit them, but I can't because I've got my kingfish gun and I'm only trying to shoot the fish that's at two to three meters range. And it's, uh, yeah, one of those lessons that I've learned. Like one big message that's coming through in this interview for me is, um, to kind of monotask. So when you're going for crayfish, go for crayfish. Don't have your spear gun sitting there ready to shoot fish. Just do the crayfish thing, then go spearfishing. It sounds like when you target southern bluefin, you're not worried about kingfish or anything else. You've got your southern bluefin gear and equipment out. Is that kind of yeah. your thoughts? Yes, exactly. So a lot of the diving in Victoria, you can multitask craze and reef fish. But when you're hunting southern bluefin, you're just there to hunt southern bluefin. Yeah. And so you kind of, Set, set up differently for that. It's all boat based uh, diving. Um, yeah, we're offshore, we're not hunting kings. They do get kings through some of the areas the southern bluefin are, but it's kind of incidental that they might come across a school of kings, just happen to come across them. But yeah, when we're out chasing bluefin, we're just specifically out blue water hunting. And a lot of the guys listening to this podcast will know how to chase big fish in the blue water and they'll know what I'm talking about. But uh, yeah, quite a lot of these guys in Victoria who might not have uh, been out chasing southern bluefin, it's uh, it's completely different gear setup. Uh, just run through some of the gear that we've been using. Uh, we've got one gun on the boat, generally one blue water gun. Uh, we might have three divers in the boat uh, but yeah, we've got one gun and it's set up with a slip tip in a breakaway setup. So we've generally got, uh, you know, 15 or 20 metres of float line and that's attached to at least two 
big floats, like two atmosphere floats. A couple of guys run the Rife uh, atmospheres, a couple of guys run uh, Ocean Hunter, and a couple of guys run different stuff. But yeah, we run two 30 litre atmosphere floats on that. And this is even chasing the 20 kilo fish as well. Um, but yeah, we've got one guy who's on the fish at the time and his job is to shoot the fish and the other guys are there to just to support him. The guy's driving the boat, he's, his, his job is to get him on the fish and put him in front of the bait ball. Um, and the other guy's there to throw pilchards or manage the float lines and floats out of the back of the boat so they don't get caught on the, on the back of the boat and uh, or jump in the water with him as well. Does he have a second shotgun? Uh, we generally have second shotguns in the boat. So when we're out chasing these uh, fish, the diver, the, the guy up for the shot, is generally sitting on the back of the boat with his fins out the back of the boat. Um, he's got a loaded gun, which is quite an unusual situation. Like a lot of guys might be against having loaded guns in the boat, but we find that they're on balance probably won't be enough time for you to jump in the water, yeah. load three or four bands, <coughs> set a slip tip, manage your line. And so we've just made extra care to have a loaded gun uh, safely pointing away from the front of the boat. So we point it towards the ocean out the back of the boat and the guy's holding onto it so it doesn't get yeah, knocked nice. about. Can you just go through that again? Sure. Because it's pretty common in blue water hunting to yeah. have a loaded gun on the back. And it goes against everything you kind of learn when you yeah. start. And so can you just run through Yeah, so uh, typically we will uh, jump in the water to load the gun and uh, so that it's set up properly for the diver. First up, we set the bands, we tension the slip tip and we just make sure that the rigging and the floats are all organised so they're not going to come out tangled. Um, he'll pass that gun back up into the boat as he gets back into the boat and he positions himself on the back of the boat. Generally the boats that we're on have some form of sort of like a seat or like the back transom is yeah. sort of yeah. um, comfortable enough to sit there with your fins hanging out the back. Uh, so then he has control of the gun so we pass the loaded gun to him and he positions that gun facing backwards out the, out the back of the boat. So if it gets knocked or something and it does discharge, it's going to shoot out the back. Sure. And he, his job is to hang on to that and uh, yeah, make sure it is facing backwards out of the boat. But yeah, it's uh, one of those situations where it goes against everything else that we yeah. learn with spear fishing and yeah. spe especially like having a loaded gun on the boat. But it's not. But like blue water hunting is very common, even if you're yep. doing dolphin fish, um, yep. marlin, any sort of these game fish, everything's ready. The diver's got his mask on, snorkel's in, he's good to go and he's sitting on the back of the boat. It's yeah, because uh, generally what happens when we approach, say, a workup and these marginal days that we're out chasing tuna, you can find dozens and dozens of workups, but they sometimes only lasts for about 30 seconds less or more some the good ones you'll come across and you'll shoot fish out of could be a lot tighter and they'll be working up for like a couple of minutes and that gives you enough time to one spot them in the distance a kilometer away get over there get your diver in the water and uh, yeah shoot a fish but sometimes you don't have very long so you're racing you're absolutely charging out there uh, you might be racing a dozen other fishing boats to get to that workup first as well. So you really want to put the hammer down. Uh, you get to the, to the workup and you want your diver in there as quickly as possible. So having that set up ready to go, he's got his mask on, uh, ready to jump in. You position him just, you know, 10 or 15 metres off the side of the bait ball, figuring out which way the, you reckon the bait's going. And so that hopefully though that bait's moving towards the diver and uh, the fish will swim into the diver, which is probably the better situation you'll get on those marginal days. So, so just give us a best case like scenario. So you've got this bait ball, there's birds smashing the top and you position, is, is the birds often working from the top? 
Yeah, okay. So you, you position your boat, the divers get in the water, and the the the, the um, workup is coming towards your dive. Everything seems to be going right. Um, what what will generally happen then, ideally? So your diver's going to jump in the water, and hopefully he's going to uh, be confronted by a wall of southern bluefin tuna. And it's happened many times, and uh, the fish are sometimes hanging a bit further away. And perhaps one of the tricks is not to chase the first fish that you see, because uh, sometimes these fish are moving so quick. So if, you've, if the fish are coming towards you, uh, they're hitting the bait pretty hard and, and then splitting off towards you. You might not have the time to aim or track your gun for a fish that's rocketing past you. So perhaps leave the first couple of fish and head into that bait ball or that workup and you will have a better chance at a fish and generally the guys who can get right into the middle of a like a tight workup with bait happening they'll have a good chance at a fish that is coming up into the bait instead of splitting off and zooming past you it's more of an instinct shot than uh like really taking your time to line up a, a sedentary reef fish do you swim down or are you shooting from the surface we shoot a lot of the fish from the surface in the top sort of five metres of water. Sometimes you do have to swim down to sort of 15 to 18 metres, but a lot of the school fish will sit up on the surface and you'll have shots up on the surface. Uh, some of the big fish will also be up on the surface. So when, you, when you're hunting those 100 kilo fish, they can sometimes come up. But then there's marginal days where there's not as many fish around and they're maybe a bit cagey and you do have to swim down to sort of like that 10 to 15 metre range. But no one's doing any big depths like no one's dropping to 20 plus meters yeah. for tuna it's rare that you have to swim deeper than five meters to shoot a tuna you don't like maybe um throw burly out and then dive at the burly and get that competitive instinct going in the fish i, I don't know i'm just some yeah we definitely use burly effectively like that and perhaps on a situation where you've come across a bait ball you'll throw a handful of pilchards in on the bait ball and you watch them all float down yeah. on the right day the fish are eating them and you, that gives you an opportunity to either track one of those pilchards yeah. or just track the fish and sort of know where the fish are going okay. sometimes if they've got a handful of pilchards that you're thrown in they'll slow down for those pilchards instead of the fast moving bait ball that's going through where they have to really hoik it out in to get a feed yeah. They can see this pilchard floating down. They're like, okay, it's not moving anywhere. So they can come in a lot slower, and oh, okay. that gives you a bit, bit better time and better opportunity to shoot them. Yeah. So what's your personal best? So my personal best is 102 kilos, cool. which uh, is great for Victoria and generally Australia. Like it's just recently that uh, we've had a good run on big fish in Victoria and South Australia. Yeah. Uh, not the first guys to be shooting barrels. There's a couple of guys in South Australia that have been chasing them mm -hmm. uh, in previous years. And uh, yeah, they really pioneered chasing big fish and it's pretty amazing to see that what they've done all those years ago. And now we're just sort of like catching up to them. <laughs> it's yeah, it's really nice to be able to pick someone's brain on something before you go out and do it yourself. Yeah. You just don't have to learn everything the hard way then. Um, when you shot that 102 kilo fish, did you stone it or? Uh, I didn't stone my fish. So on that day, they the the tuna weren't responding to pilchards at all. We had, you know, 10 or 15 kilos on board and we'd thrown in about five or six kilos to work out that they weren't eating them. That's just what you do. Uh, on this occasion, there were uh, just big workups happening uh, and there were about 30 other boats out there, so it was mayhem on the water. We just had to be in the right place at the right time. And in that situation, these workups happen, but they're not specifically on one spot. They'll happen like 500 metres that way or 200 metres that way. And the playing field's quite spread out. So if you've got 30 boats there, it can be quite congested, but you'll still have opportunities to get uh, your boat to a bait work up first. On this occasion, that's just what had happened. Uh, I was up, my 
my uh, teammate had shot a fish early in the day. He shot one at eight o'clock, so the pressure was kind of off for the day, which was great. But the job was now reversed. He was the captain and I was the diver, uh, and he put me straight onto the bait ball first up. It was a good one. It was a tight work up, and the fish were coming up pretty fast, uh, and the bait was moving really fast as well. So. I was struggling to swim after the bait and try and get a decent shot at these fish, yeah. just as all the other boats were coming in around to try and get in on the fish as well. Uh, but for some reason, the seals ba bailed up this uh, bait ball and stopped it long enough for me to watch a fish come out of nowhere. And I don't even know if I dived on the fish. I was later told that I did. Um, I just ran on instinct and plugged this fish top down. I didn't know how good the shot was. I didn't see the shot specifically. It just took off at a rate of knots that a hundred kilo tuna can swim, oh, wow. swim at. Um, and I just had to trust the gear from there on out. Yeah. Uh, it took about 30 minutes to land the fish. We use a sort of a clutch system that you use one of the floats to drag up the fish and you can sort of like inch the float down the line and pull that that fish up and it's sort of instead of you trying to pull up a 100 kilo fish which a couple of the other crew were trying to do and they've tried to do they've learnt that it's pretty hard uh, we're using those floats to work at our advantage to pull them up and uh, yeah, it was about 30 minutes to bring it up it was a good shot uh, the slip tip had toggled perfectly. Uh, we used a bungee in the system as well, so it was a real soft landing on the fish. Uh, that slip tip didn't tear out. A lot of guys that will use uh, chase big fish, they might not have a bungee in the system and I've heard of guys that have lost fish even though they're using a slip tip and I've also heard of guys that have landed their fish but their slip tips are still pulling through because it's quite a soft flesh of the southern bluefin. But on this occasion, our slip tip was didn't break the surface, so I was just seated perfectly on the other side and it's just a matter of getting the fish up to the surface. And then the hard part starts. Yeah. Uh, we've got two guys uh, trying to lift a 100 kilo fish into the boat. And hang on, hang on. You got the fish back to you, it's still alive. Is it just the hand and the gill? You've got this huge barrel. How do you stick your knife in <coughs> thing like that? So in this situation, we use a second shot uh, to try and stone the fish and ideally what you'll do is you bring the fish up to a, you know a few meters under the surface and then sit there and uh, pin it until you stone it okay. uh, which is what I did uh, on another occasion just as a side story I was out with a guy who shot 120 kilo fish yeah. and he was trying to put the knife in in into the fish to uh, icky jimmy it mm. and uh, he's just not succeeding because he doesn't have a long enough knife. Because you need a sword. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Those Japanese <laughs> tuna swords. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. I was like, you've got these, those things are huge, like yeah. compared to what we're used to normally shooting, where it's just yeah. a, you know, like. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a bit of a different fish that mm. you're targeting. Mm. Uh, but yeah, on this occasion, brought it up, second shot it, uh, had the fish. Best thing you can do is throw a tail rope around the fish mm. and tie it off. So you, and then, uh, the, yeah, the problem that we had was there were two guys in the boat, just myself and my captain, and, uh, yeah, trying to lift a 100 kilo fish over the side of the boat's a massive issue. Yeah, and sure. it took about 40, 50 minutes to get over the side, but we managed some yes. satisfaction. Is your major issue spearfishing all about equalising? i got good news for you. We've been pumping Ted Hardy's immersion freediving equalising classes for a while now for free on the No Spirit Podcast because we love it that much. It's effective. Now, his Roadmap to Friends All class is absolutely excellent. It's a full-on video course that will help you to master the technique of Friends All because you're probably doing Valsalva. Now, Ted's sweetened it up a little bit more. He's got a 15% discount code. Go to noobspero.com forward slash TED, get full access to the Roadmap to Frenzel Equalizing class, and if you don't learn how to Frenzel within 30 days, he'll give you a full money back refund. Now, everyone wants to get beyond that 15 to 40 foot mark, that five to 10 meter mark, and you don't want to be going upright to have to equalize. You need to learn the Frenzel Equalizing technique, and the best way to do that 
is spend a little bit of time doing Ted Hardy's course. Come to noobsparrow.com forward slash Ted. Get a 15% discount. Enjoy. I've got heaps of quick quick questions. Um, I want to know what your gear is from one point to the float. But um, before that, mm. when, when you get a fish like that back on the boat, there's not an S gear in the world or on a recreational fishing boat big enough to hold that fish, is it just straight in? On that occasion, what we do is we've got half a dozen bags of ice. We clean the fish, we gill and gut it, yep. uh, and throw bags of ice uh, right. on inside. We also run towels and we coat the fish with towels and spray seawater over it and evaporative cooling it as the wind blows, the it, it cools it down. But you're still getting back to the ramp, like even even if you're shooting fish, you're still getting back to the ramp and the fish is pretty warm because they've worked hard. Like it's essentially a, hung, a 100 kilo piece of muscle that yeah. is fighting for its life on the end of your gear and they do warm up. So yeah, the best thing you can do is once you've got your fish head in, treat it with respect and sort of like put it on ice as quickly as possible. Yeah, sure. A lot of guys talk about using D shackles and removing points of failure between the spear gun and the and the floats. Can you just run? So you, before you talked about a, a maybe using a bungee and then a float line. What are all your connection points? The full 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 setup. So we've got a slip tip with the wire uh, trace on the front. Uh, either wire or splice Dyneema for the shooting line. Uh, I've watched quite a lot of guys use mono and. It's quite risky running mono. If you've got any nicks on your mono, it's gonna snap the mono and quite a lot of guys have lost fish because they run old mono or they have, they're just like something in that part of the rig has failed. Yeah. Uh, we do use D shackles, but we don't use shark clip connections between the bungee and the float line or the float line and the floats. We're using either a spliced Dyneema knot or a um, D shackle in that situation. Yep. The only shark clip that we've run is on a tag float or yep. like the working float, which you're using to either um, clutch the, the, the that float down or um, as like a clip on the second shotgun. But we, mm. we, yeah, we're trying to remove as many points of failure as possible. And what a lot of the guys don't, probably don't appreciate with a fish that big is how much power it has when it runs and yeah a lot of the guys have been caught out with things like snapped shooting line uh snapped float lines they've had uh like uh floats break off they've had uh their floats that they're using are unpressurized so they've got like just you know a, a regular 10 15 litre float or whatever into a uh, you know another couple of floats and they might think they've got enough force to hold up a fish that size but it's uh yeah it just takes all their gear um and then yeah they've had had quite a few failures in terms of things like uh single floppered shafts pulling out of the fish or even uh marginal shots on fish pulling straight out and yeah the fish will swim away with a ill-placed shot or something that's yeah not holding on strong enough so we advocate for slip tips it's one of those situations where particularly with the bigger fish uh, you put a lot of time and effort into going out chasing these fish we like for us it's a two-day trip for chasing tuna we will either do go there that afternoon and we'll stay down it's you know we can drive anywhere up to sort of six hours away to chase these fish uh, stay overnight we have driven you know 500 kilometers to get there drag the boat the whole way we're spending a bit more than 20 bucks on the water and fuel uh, we've spent you know a hundred dollars on pilchards for the day uh, you put in all this time effort and money so to skimp out on things that are in your control like having a gun that's powerful enough or having floats that are going to hold the fish up or you know something that's going to have the ranges this doesn't quite make sense like you want to you want to 
make your best opportunity and sort of put in the best effort because you're going to all this effort and time and effort and it costs. So why don't you just put in a bit more and like buy the right gear, take enough pilchards. There's been times when I've taken four kilos of pilchards or eight kilos of pilchards and you run out and it's just like there's fish there and they were coming into them and now we're never going to shoot a fish for the rest of the day because we don't have enough bait. I'm just conscious of time. Um, guys, if you want to ask any more questions, whether you listen to the podcast or you're here live, Southern Spearfishing on Instagram about um, the bluefin tuna anytime, I'm sure you'd be happy to answer that. Maybe you could send me a checklist of what you would take out on a day in terms of supplies and stuff like that. And that way guys have got some insight into what it takes to plan and prepare adequately for a trip like this. I get your heart on the matter. You've gone out and spent all that time and money and energy, but you're also seeing a fish swim off wounded is, is the last thing you want. Want, so completely get it as i said conscious of time but so i wanted to move on but but just quickly um etiquette between line fishing boats and spear fishing boats where do we go wrong where do they go wrong how can we make it all work yes it's a um a fiery topic but we all have the right to be there it's all our ocean and you know there's we've had times on the water where line fishermen have treated us pretty poorly and uh, we've also had times on the water when other spearos have been pretty poor and it's just a situation that I'd like you know divers in general to go out and give respect to other water users no matter what they are mm. but saying that there's some amazing line fishermen out there and amazing spearos that you know will let you take the first run at that work up and it's one of those things where if you're on that bait ball first it's kind of you you're there first and for guys to come in afterwards and sort of try and cross in over someone's fishing line or if a boat's trolling through and cutting off lures at the back that's not really on and you know we i think we deserve respect as spiros if we're on there first and so do the linos too they're yeah. they're they're one of those situations where you know if they're there give them a wide berth, especially if they're trolling lures out the back. Um, there can be quite a fair way out the back. Uh, and especially if they're trolling, they're gonna troll through and then you're gonna leave the work up to us so we can go straight in there. Yeah. And that's, that's something that, you know, a bit of respect on the water goes a long way back at the ramp. Nice, so I'll sum that up. Don't be a dick. Um, first in, first served. First in, first served. And um, if you're Bodie, run interference. <laughs> like you know what I mean by that. Um, I want to move on though, just just because we've got time constraints. Um, funniest moment out on the water. Um, you've listened to the show, but you've heard a few. I've, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, so my funniest moment. There's been a few, but this specific time. Um, so I dive off a jet ski quite a lot. It's uh, one of the best pieces of dive gear that you can have for a solo diver. And I'd managed to convince one of my mates to get one as well. I think he saw what I, uh, what I, what I was doing and thought it was a pretty, pretty good idea. Um, but I was conscious that this was one of the first times he'd been out on the water. And uh, he, he might not know where we're going. He, it was the first time at this location. I'd dived it quite a few times. Um, and that was on the east side of Wilson's Prom. And for those who know it, Corner Inlet is a big sort of shallow bay. It's uh, shallow sand flats that have high tidal range. And the way that the channel out through Corner Inlet runs is a big sweeping arc. And you can run out through the shipping channel because it's um, like it's a working port or you can cut the sand mud flats on the right tide and so I was telling my mate you know like if you're gonna head out there just don't cut the corner just don't don't whatever you do cut the corner because you know it might look okay but there's a good chance that you'll come across a sand bank uh, or something so just stick to the channel Anyway, that trip was quite a nightmare for me. I had uh, battery problems 25 k's offshore. I had a, like a loose battery terminal, which 
we managed to pull into one of the coves and sort out and then it came back and then it was okay and then it was not okay. So I decided to pull the pin halfway through the day and come back early with uh, one of my mates. And I uh, was running pretty quick coming back in. I was doing about 60 k's an hour with my mate who was, uh, was ghosting me in. Uh, and I just happened to be about five meters on the inside of the channel markers and I hit the sand bank at 60 k's an hour oh. just as my mate turned over to watch me fly headfirst over the handlebars and I did a couple of somersaults into the shallows and uh, yeah, he, uh, he couldn't help himself but he did come and help me uh, <laughs> pull the ski off the sand bank. So despite, uh, despite Warning my mate, he was uh, out there for the first time. I Definitely. probably should have taken my own uh, advice and not cut the channels. Classic. We are wrap we're going to wrap it up very shortly because we're going to get into this panel interview after a short break. Um, I just wanted to get you to run quickly through your standard um, gear bag for Melbourne diving non-southern bluefin tuna. Just, just, just. Quickly. So my bag is a 110 centimetre gun. I don't know when. Okay, so I've got two guns actually, my 95cm aimright roller, which I use to shoot squid. If I'm not shooting squid, I use a 110cm gun because I don't know when a kingfish is going to swim in front of me, so I've got a bigger gun for that. Then <coughs> I've got a Aqualung Technisub Micro Mask. I use a wide bore snorkel, the Boucher snorkel, uh, just because I feel like that extra last breath is a bit easier and it's easy to breathe up on. I have a handful of 7mm uh, wetty wetsuits which I've used for long enough so that one of them's about 3mm now, it's compressed that much, and the next one's about 5mm and the newest one's about 7mm. And I normally wear the 5mm, 7mm through summer and I wear the 7mm most other times outside of summer just means I've got a few extra weights, but I'm pretty warm and comfortable. Cool. I recently picked up a pair of the uh, Dive R fins and they're just composite blades. Uh, they're super comfy, they've got a lot of power. I was really surprised how good they were, but I definitely appreciate those. There's two other things that I've kind of adapted for Melbourne. One's a GPS watch. I uh, use a GPS watch to mark all my cray holes and that's been super effective in remembering where they are six months later when I try and find that cray ledge and my memory is not that good. <laughs> uh, and the other thing's a jet ski. Uh, it's an amazing... Does that fit in your dive bag? It does. <laughs> my dive garage at least. Uh, but the jet ski is probably the, the thing that makes the coastline accessible and I can explore it. Uh, effectively, it's cheap to run, cheap to wash up at the end of the day, and maintenance is pretty good on that one, mm. too. But outside of that, I'm just, I don't really know what my other stuff is. I've just got stuff that I've thought about in previous years, enough to make a purchase and mm. go, oh, I can forget about it now. But they're sort of the main things in that respect. It's one of the main reasons I ask about equipment, because over the years, you slowly iterate, you improve, you adapt your equipment, and you get exactly what you want, and then you forget about it. And uh, it's funny where guys have, what they've forgotten about, but yeah. you know, everyone's got their preferences, so it's good stuff. Um, last question before we head into a break. In one sentence, can you describe what the spearfishing experience means to you? Turbo loves this question. Yes, it's a good Get one. Uh, so spearfishing is easily the most expensive way to collect free seafood. <laughs> <laughs> good, I like it. Yeah. Parting advice? Parting advice, um, respect your catch, especially if you, uh, you know, targeting those big southern bluefin tuna, really like to call out all the spiros and, you know, use good gear. We definitely want to see you guys get onto them. Uh, but bring the appropriate gear and uh, go and target them and you'll have much better success in that respect. And also go to uh, Southern Spearfishing uh, online on all the socials and, uh, yeah, mm. check it out.
All good. Yeah, no, thanks, James. Um, yeah, at Southern Spearing on Spearfishing on Instagram. Yeah. I'll link it up in today's show notes as well. Guys can come and pest you if they have any questions about some of the stuff we've talked about today. Um, so awesome, James. Thanks, man. Thank um, we're going to head into a 10 minute break. I just wanted to give my book a bit of a punt. This was the first 50 interviews we did on the show. So there's just actionable tips and information in there to just help improve your spearfishing. Come and have a look if you like. And the Spiro log, which we talked about. But you can really, you can design your own spearfishing log. Um, just, just use a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet and, and hook in. You can add all the variables you like in there and that's a good way to get into it. Now, I don't know about you, but I love new gear and spearfishing.com.au have got a huge range, mad flat shipping rate, especially in Australia. And if you use the code Noob Sparrow, you not only support us, but you get $20 off every purchase over $200. That's right, pump in the code Noob Sparrow at checkout, N-O-O-B-S-P-E-A-R-O at spearfishing.com.au and you will save 20 bucks on every purchase over $200. No brainer. Thanks, Adrena. Hey guys, I just um, introducing this introduction uh, to give you a quick message and update from James, who's on the line with me now. So you had a quick listen to um, the interview that you and I did live in store there at Adrena, and you had a couple of extra points to make uh, that you feel like we didn't cover too well in the interview itself. So. Um, I know one of the ones you wanted to discuss briefly was um, specifically guns used for targeting southern bluefin tuna. You had some specific recommendations for the sort of the blue water weapon you want to use. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah that's correct. Uh, probably should have covered it a bit better on the night, but here we are. Just wanted to say that we're taking out massive guns, like big blue water cannons for hunting those big barrels. and even still, even still, we're shooting these fish at very close range, and even still, the shafts are generally not punching too far through the fish. So, just an indication, we use uh, a couple of different guns. One of them's a custom double roller. It's a 130 double roller, and it's been put together by one of my mates, and he's really tricked it out and runs super hot bands. Uh, it's just really hard to load in the water generally. Can barely load it, which is a good sign that it's got enough power putting into the into the spear. And yep. uh, we're running on that shaft, we're running an eight and a half mil uh, shaft and a slip tip. And all the fish that we've shot, the big fish, 100 kilo fish, they've been shot at a distance between one one and a half and maybe two metres from the end of the spear. So we're not talking about massive long shots on those fish. And even still, the shaft is just just punching through the fish and just leaving half in, half out. So it goes to show that even these big guns with these big fish, there's, there's such a thick fish to get through. So we, we, we're having to put a lot of power into the guns. One of the other ones that we're using is a, uh, a three-band Rife uh, blue water cannon and it's about a one, 140 centimetre gun and again three super hot bands running a really thick shaft because you need that weight to uh, punch through the fish and again us using a slip tip is sort of crucial in that, that respect. Uh, and the other thing I, I also wanted to cover with guys that are probably not used to uh, hunting big fish in Victoria, you might might start off on the kingfish uh, as your first pelagic here. And it, as I said, or as I say in the, on the night, you get them sort of fairly small, up to about 20 kilos here. But the guys uh, might not appreciate that when you're pulling in a fish. Uh, that they will tend to do circles underneath you when you're pulling up the line. And it's the same with the big fish as well. And the risk for that with the new guys going out chasing these fish, if they're not familiar with how to sort of uh, drag up a fish from the depths and have a fish just underneath you is that these fish will do circles and they've got a shooting line coming out 
up to your hand and if you're trying to sort of bring that fish to your, the surface and it's doing big circles underneath you or uh, taking off a little bit then resting so you're pulling it back in you might get that line caught on your fin or on your hand or something or get wrapped up as it sort of drags you around a bit and then we've had it a couple of times with the big barrels that they will get a second wind and they'll take off and the big risk there is that they'll take you with you with them as uh, as they dive down again into into the depths when you've got a fin caught or a uh, your belt caught or something something gets caught up in that line so 100 percent of it is once you've got a fish on it's that float line awareness making sure you know it exactly where it is and sort of um keeping that in awareness as, as to where you move the fish and position your body and stuff is that kind of what you yeah, get yeah exactly exactly and a lot of the times we've got a second diver in the water who's just managing the float lines and the shooting line just to drag them back and behind or just loop it off the top of your snorkel or mask and one of my mates has got a, a great video and I wish you'd put it online where he uh, shoots a fairly good tuna it's about 27 30 kilos give or take and he shot shot it with a real gun and as he brings it up to the surface he's got you know 30 meters of real line out behind him and this fish is doing circles underneath him and he goes down to plug it again with a second gun great idea but that was also a real gun and the fish takes off and he's just got two real lines out in the water he's trying to pull them in uh, and it's just doing circles in and around and underneath him and on top of him and the lines get caught up all over his GoPro and snorkel and mask and he just had the sense to put the herd on the fish and bring it up and get it in hand quick enough and dispatch it then otherwise it could have been a pretty serious situation with so much line about. Alright, um, well I mean guys are going to get a, a real sense of uh, of these fish as we get more in depth into this interview which is coming up right after this but I uh, just appreciate you yeah, jumping back on the line with me and sort of clarifying a couple of bits and pieces because um, that'll make much more sense to these guys when they start to listen to our veterans vault section on the southern bluefin tuna so cheers James was there anything else we missed buddy? No I think that pretty much covers it mate thanks for everything and thanks for the day at diving on the ski uh, it was it was good fun man can't wait to see you get one. <laughs> I, I don't know if you got it from today's interview, but uh, at the start of this live interview in the Melbourne store, I was super nervous, and uh, James was a real gracious fellow there, and we rolled on pretty well. Um, he's got knowledge for days, did not even begin to tap into it in this interview, and uh, I think the day after, him and I headed out and dived off his jet ski, which I'd never really done before, and uh, just working out the system with two guys on a jet ski, and uh, I'm pretty I'm a pretty big guy as well, so um, James just has everything organised, um, it was super simple, but really nice diving, just zipping around on a jet ski inside Port Phillip Bay, I was absolutely spoilt, and uh, it, was, it, was, it was super cool to get out for a day diving with him, but um, in another week, we're going to get an early release episode. I'm chatting with the founder of Scorkle, which is, uh, it's like a pony bottle. Um, very interesting product. Uh, very interesting idea and, and obviously an innovator. He got on and supported our Kickstarter campaign for 99 Tips to Get Better at Spearfishing and, and asked for an interview slot. So I'm going to introduce you guys to the brand new product called Scorkle. And it's a pony bottle. Um, if you are in a state where that allows um, taking of maybe shellfish or crayfish or or even fish on on um, compressed air then perhaps scorkle might be something you're interested in it's a huge debate about the ethics of of, of hunting on scuba a lot of guys that go full dive full-time free dive spearfishing um, sort of steer clear of compressed air so there's there is an ethical but there's an element of that conversation um, as well along with that interview with the Scorkle founder I get into another man in the area nine pin wetsuit uh, founder Luke Growney and I got out for a full day diving with him as well and uh, we chat some of the local diving that he's done and doing and uh, it's an interesting chat about nine pin wetsuits so I'll see you again in a week and if you are a big fan of the show and uh, you're going to be back next week and listen, I'd love it if you could get on patreon.com forward slash Spiro and support the show on an episode by episode basis. All of the money that goes to Patreon funds trips out 
interviewing people in their local areas and hopefully getting out for a dive with you guys. And uh, New Zealand's loosely penciled in for February. Hopefully Patreon can fund that. I'm Shrek. This is the Noobs Podcast. Thanks for listening again. See you next week.